Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. <clears throat> it's also an honor. Um, <clears throat> if you're a Canadian like me, coming to a grand <clears throat> English country house makes you feel grand and special, and I want this illusion to remain as long as possible. <laughs> yeah. um, I spent 20 very happy years in the United Kingdom, and so as I look out across this audience, I see my whole life flashing in front of me. Old friends, people from whom I've learned, people I've jousted with, people who put me up overnight on their couches, people who've taught me things, including Philip Stevens. Um, it really is an honor to be here, and a very personal one to be here. And it's a room full of people of immense um, geopolitical experience. If you're not put off your stroke by the presence close at your side of a foreign, foreign secretary of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, you don't know what you're doing here. So I'm, I salute you, sir, and many of the other distinguished people in the audience. Um, let me get to it, and uh, let me then say I look forward to the questions, which is a lecturer's polite way of saying I'm deeply alarmed by the prospect of questions, but I will pretend to be pleased with them. Um, my subject is the world after Ukraine. <clears throat> Russia's annexation of Crimea has shaken our assumptions about the global order that took shape after 1989. We assumed either that Russia was an impotent spoiler or an aspiring partner. And we believe that Russia and Europe's shared interests in economic integration would make forcible alteration of European borders a thing of the past. And all of these illusions have been shattered in the last couple of months. And we're still arguing now about how to react accordingly. And the issues, the policy issues, go beyond sanctions. The fundamental issue is whether to accept that Ukraine <clears throat> falls within a Russian sphere of influence with concomitant limitations on Ukrainian sovereignty and uh, its capacity to shape its own future freely, or whether we stand for Ukrainian self-determination and territorial integrity and stand with them until they achieve those goals. We're being pulled in two very different ways. Values, democratic freedom, European unity, pull us one day, one way, while interests close economic ties and energy interdependence are pulling us another. And Crimea is not the only event that is making us search for our bearings with the proclamation of a terrorist caliphate in the borderlands of Syria and Iraq, the dissolution of the state order created by Mr. Sykes and Monsieur Picot in 1916, is dissolving before our eyes. And even if the caliphate is eventually crushed, as it may well be, putting the Humpty Dumpty of existing state order in the Middle East back together may no longer be possible. The reordering of our world is truly global. In East Asia, naval fleets are circling each other. Chinese oil platforms are drilling in disputed waters. Belligerent accusations fly between Asian capitals. China no longer speaks the language of quiet rise. Xi Jinping has adopted a muscular foreign policy that's alarming Vietnam, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, and the United States. And we sense dimly in this room, I sense dimly, that these changes in Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia are connected to each other. We sense to use an old cliche that the tectonic plates this time really are shifting. And we question whether anyone in Washington, London, Moscow, or Beijing truly grasps the full extent of what's going on. So this is a good moment to consider what narrative is available to us to make sense of what's happening. Now, narrative is a phrase usually used by novelists and uh, literary scholars. But narrative, that is, what stories about history <clears throat> tell us what history means, seem to me to be the single most decisive <laughs> mental construct shaping the foreign policy of states. 
I had a very telling example of just how pertinent and how malign narrative can be two weeks ago when I was in Sarajevo. And I went for the June 28th commemoration of the assassination of the Archduke. And I went in company with a great Canadian, Anglo-Canadian scholar, Margaret McMillan, and Sir Adam Roberts, who will be known to many of you. And Margaret McMillan's speech spelled out, I thought in fascinating detail, the dire ways in which wrong narratives in June and July 1914 decisively shape policy reaction to the crisis. The ruling assumption on all sides, she argues, was that the risks of handing out ultimata between empires, those risks were manageable because war, if it came, would be short. After all, the Balkan War of 1912 had been short, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 had been short, so why not wouldn't the Austro-Hungarian-Serbian confrontation be equally short? That assumption was why wise men and fanatics alike, Sigmund Freud on the one hand and, Adam, uh, and Adolf Hitler on the other, reacted with exultation when Austro-Hungary issued an ultimatum to Serbia. Both wise men and fat fanatics failed to understand that the next war would be tragically different. It was only Helmut von Moltke, the victor at Sedan in 1870, who had warned at the end of his life that the next war would not be a cabinet war, but a people's war. And woe to the person who lit the spark. And few listened to von Moltke's premonition. So the 1914 commemorations should sober us all up. They were fighting the last war, and we should make, avoid making the same mistake. And we need to try and understand what's generally, genuinely new about the pattern of international relations. The thing we're trying to understand is the unprecedented degree of global economic and technological integration between rival blocs. Russia supplies Germany its gas. Germany supplies Russia its core industrial and manufacturing goods. China buys US Treasury debt. Apple makes its iPhones and iPads in China. This degree of economic integration surpasses anything achieved either in the first globalization, which culminated in 1914, or the second globalization, which culminated in 1989. And the degree of integration that we lived through in the third globalization, I think, basically means that the new Cold War, or a new Cold War, is simply the wrong narrative to use in trying to understand what's going on today. The Cold War occurred between autarkies, each close to each other. In 1948, our policy question was, was which rival autarky would prevail, not which Russian oligarch with palaces in London should have their ac ac accounts frozen. In 1948, the Russian challenge to West Germany was to its very survival as a democratic republic. In 2014, the Russian challenge to Germany is to its central heating. In 1962, the placement of missiles in Cuba brought the world to the edge of nuclear war. In 2014, few think that the annexation of Russia is the first step in the recreation of a Soviet empire. And one of the reasons we think that, and I think so we should, and we think rightly, is that the ideological confrontations of the Cold War have vanished and they will not return. We forget that from the Russian Revolution onwards, millions of people, true believers, fought and in some cases died in the belief, a scientific belief, that there existed a socialist alternative to the capitalist mode of production. By 1989, when the Soviet empire collapsed, the hopes invested in the socialist mode of production and the radiant tomorrow that was supposed to accompany it <coughs> had died. And I think one thing we learn <coughs> definitively is while there are many alternative ways to organize capitalist society and politics, there is simply no workable alternative to capitalism as a system of production. In, in 1989, that question was settled. And this is what Fr Francis Fukuyama meant when he told us that history had ended in 1989. And of course, that was a foolish claim. <laughs> foolish claims can sometimes do you a hell of a lot of good. And, Fukuyama's claim that history had ended is one of the classic examples of making a foolish claim that makes you famous forever. But the core of what he said, he was right to believe 
that the history-defining contest between capitalism and communism was over. But now, 25 years on, from the Polish border to the Pacific, from the Arctic Circle to the Afghan border, a new political competitor to liberal democracy has taken shape. And this new political competitor, Fukuyama did not anticipate. It's authoritarian in political form, it's capitalist in economics, and it's nationalist in ideology. Lawrence Summers had call, has called this new form mercantilist authoritarianism, which certainly captures the central role that the state and state enterprises play in both the Russian and Chinese economies. Mercantilism, however, seems to me slightly too polite. It misses the crude and vulgar element of cronyism that's central to Putin's economic model and to the economic uh, operations of the Communist Party of China. This authoritarian capitalism, which is what I would call it, is now liberal democracy's chief competitor. And if we're to meet the challenge it presents, we have to understand how it operates from the inside. The prices that define or the, the prices that determine what Mr. Putin gets for his oil, gas, and minerals are set on the global market. And so this model is not autarkic. It's a capitalist, it's integrated into the capitalist economy. It's open to the competitive pressures of global <coughs> price systems. And the allocation of economic reward inside the system, that is, who is rich and who is poor, is determined largely by a state apparatus centralized in the hands of the president and his cronies. So the, Ru the new Russia and China are, to use Asimoglu and Robinson's term, extractive oligarchies. They exclude all but a few insiders from the exercise of economic and political power. There are few institutional checks and balances that are constitutionally anchored. Rule of law and an independent judiciary exist in theory, but not in practice. And therefore, any economic challenger to the political insiders know that if they do mount a political challenge to the regime, the law will not protect them. Now, of course, there are significant differences between the Chinese and Russian variants of authoritarian capitalism. In the Chinese model, the party retains its monopoly role. While there are managed elections at the village level, no pretense is offered that the system is actually democratic. Russia does pretend to be democratic. There are former constitutional guarantees, there are elections, but no one should doubt that the ultimate control rests with the Soviet nomenclatura and the secret police. In the Chinese case, the Communist Party traditions of state order have been grafted on an ancient, very distinguished, long tradition inherited from the Han emperors. In the Russian case, uh, the, the Putin administration has kept alive the Soviet and Tsarist traditions of state administration, yet the guiding role of the Communist Party is no more. The guiding part, role remains in China, but not in, in Russia. In Russia, formal political pluralism exists. There are multiple political parties, but only the President's party has any chance. There are free media, but only the President's party has access to the media that reach beyond Petersburg and Moscow. And the, the President understands that he may have lost the middle class in Petersburg and Moscow, but that doesn't matter as long as he's got a deep, vice-like grip on the deep countryside of rural Russia. In, in this is where his power is based, and it's where it's secure. The Chinese case is slightly different. It's the cities that the party keeps under tight control while to tolerating sporadic dissent down in, the, in, in, in rural China, where resentment at migration restrictions, land evictions, and house demolitions remain endemic. Chinese authoritarianism on balance is more relentless and efficient than the Russian. The Chinese population is kept under closer watch. Dissidents are routinely imprisoned, and the regime monitors the internet intensively, allowing individuals to vent, but snuffing out any sign of a collective challenge to the regime. Now, what's interesting about this is, is I think, the following element. In both societies, people are free to travel, to holiday, to immigrate even. They're free to grumble in private, 
But anyone who mounts a collective challenge, whether it be a virtual meeting in a chat room or a street demonstration, can be met with force if the challenge is serious enough. Both Putin and Xi Jinping, and this is what distinguishes this authoritarianism from anything that's gone before, these regimes have grasped the paradox that the more private freedom their citizens enjoy, the less they will demand the exercise of public liberty. Private liberty, in fact, acts as a safety valve to contain any discontent about the denial of democratic freedom. In fact, private liberty makes efficient market performance possible. You can't have a capitalist system and the growth that they've achieved without threat private freedom. Their discovery is that it's private freedom that makes state domination possible. This is the complex new form we're looking at. And they are getting together. When Putin and Xi Jinping met recently, they signed a multi-year energy and infrastructure deal that sealed what was much more than an economic uh, pact, but in fact a long-term strategic alliance. They put their long-standing border disputes in abeyance. They've tamped down their rivalry as regional powers. And what makes this new alliance stable is the overwhelming preponderance of China. It would not be stable if they were both roughly comparable in power, but the overwhelming preponderance is with the Chinese. And the Russians know that any challenge to China's dominance in Asia would be futile. What unites them further, of course, is shared hostility to what the Princeton political science, scientist John Eikenberry has called the liberal leviathan, the United States and its global web of encircling alliances. Now, what's interesting about this is that this new authoritarian capitalism is unlikely to make many friends abroad. But we should remember it's quite attractive to crony capitalist regimes in the developing world because it seems to promise that you can have growth without freedom. And extractive elites love that proposition. And we're going to see more of that, growth without freedom, growth without public freedom, I mean. Now, what does this mean for the international order? While Europeans and Americans tend to believe that Crimea marked the moment when the post-89 order came apart. For the Russians and the Chinese, the international order came apart 15 years earlier, over Kosovo. It came apart at the moment when NATO warplanes bombed Belgrade and struck the Chinese embassy. From that moment, Chinese and Russian authoritarianism were soldered together, because it was, in fact, right after that that Putin took power for the first time. And so from the Russian and Chinese point of view, the international order came apart over Kosovo. And it's the Kosovo president, precedent, significantly, unilateral secession orchestrated by a great power that Putin uses to justify Crimea with cautious approbation from Beijing. So how does this strategic alliance look? as it goes forward. Both these powers can be counted on to use their seats on the Security Council to defend the Syrian dictator and many other serial human rights abusers. They can be counted on to stymie any form of multilateral humanitarian intervention in any place where their interests are directly involved. The open question, the uncertain question, is how the two powers will react to the fragmentation of state order in the Middle East. For the moment, Russia and China, together with Iran, have been the major strategic beneficiaries of American misadventure in the Middle East. And for the moment, all three are content to allow the Obama administration to pay the political price for allowing a region shaped by American dominance to fall apart. This is a spoiler role. Let the big guy play the price. Watch how it develops reap all the benefits of being joint spoilers in the international order. The question is whether uh, that is sustainable as the um, ISIS caliphate, caliphate consolidates. I want to shift the focus to two other questions about authoritarian capitalism. The first question is, are these regimes stable? And the second question is, are they aggressive? The two questions, of course, are related. 
unstable authoritarians survive through aggression by distracting discontented populations with foreign adventures. My view is that one of the things I want to attack in this lecture is the idea that uh, Russia is a kind of declining, <clears throat> unstable power. I think, in fact, that authoritarian societies have powerful advantages over democratic ones. They can make decisions more rapidly. They can marshal resources of labor and capital by executive decision. While democratic societies, as I learned by painful personal political experience, have to first overcome the veto points that exist at every point in a decision chain. Moreover, since authoritarian societies can suppress and channel and shape public opinion, they can also channel nationalist emotions into powerful uh, justifications for overseas adventurism. And the particular form of adventurism to which these societies are, are prone is protection of their language speakers in someone else's real estate. And the shoe that hasn't dropped is, is when the Chinese decide to step up protecting their Chinese speakers in someone else's real estate in Asia. That has not happened, but it's conceivable. Um, on the other side, these are, those are some of the forces that make authoritarian societies enduring. It also has to be said that authoritarian oligarchies are also brittle. Their rulers believe they have to control everything, or soon they'll control nothing. And their chief dilemma, as, we, as I think we all know, is how to manage the political aspirations unleashed by their own rapid growth. Under Stalin and Mao, rising aspirations for voice could be crushed by force and violence. Under the new authoritarianism, some private freedom has to be tolerated, since it's the condition of capitalist progress itself. When growth follows a capitalist path, many of those middle class, middle class wealth holders come to owe their wealth to their own efforts, not just to party or political connections. And as their economic autonomy grows, their demands for political voice grow also. And unless the two systems find ways to incorporate voice, their demands can become disruptive. The Chinese moment of disruption, obviously, was Tiananmen in 1989, the Russian regime's moment of destabilization were the massive street demonstrations in Moscow 2012. And significantly, both regimes met these systemic challenges with the same response, by screwing down domestic dissent and by embarking on foreign adventures designed to rally the middle class <laughs> around unifying nationalist causes. China's assertiveness in Asia is driven by a lot of things including the need to find energy sources close to home, but it's also driven by a desire to r rally its rising middle class around what Xi Jinping calls the China dream, in which China rises to become not just a regional hegemon, but a global power. In the Russian case, the strategic dilemmas are rather similar. Legitimizing extractive rule to a brittle and discontented middle class at home while meeting the challenge of American alliance encirclement on its frontiers. Putin's response to these challenges has been similar to China's, but it has to take into account a significantly weaker economic position. But to repeat the point, we should be aware, I think, of exaggerating Russia's weaknesses. The conventional view about the Putin regime is that he's perched atop a society in demographic and economic decline with decaying infrastructure, weak health care, and failing social protection. And I think this is wishful thinking. I think this is a false narrative that returns us complacently to that old vision of Soviet Russia as upper Volta with rockets. Because <laughs> on the contrary, Russia's staggering natural resource wealth gives it a certain source of state revenue right through the 21st and 22nd centuries, while its limited regime of private freedom creates a safety valve that allows the regime to contain democratic discontent. For millions of Russians, the freedom to travel, to immigrant, to save and invest more than compensates for the occasional brutality the regime displays towards the brave minority who continue to demand an end to authoritarian rule. And it's this, to repeat my point, this unique combination of private liberty and public despotism that separates the new authoritarianism from its Soviet and Maoist past. 
and I think probably guarantees the long-term stability of both. To be sure, this new form of rule has little outward ideological appeal. <coughs> Europe and the United States may have a lot of difficulty with immigration, but one thing I can tell you as the son of an immigrant is that immigration is a sure sign that somebody wants to come to your country, right? It's a vote of confidence in your country. Uh, I hope the British remember that. Because um, <laughs> I'm not sure my grandparents would get into this country anymore. But I, Jean Pass, excuse me. Normal service is now resumed. Um, <laughs> the contrast I want to make is that no one is migrating to Russia or China. Their society is about migration, not immigration. They're not, this is not an attractive model for millions of people. But the fact that authoritarian capitalism does not appeal to outsiders does not mean it lacks internal legitimacy or support. Now, when you look at the confection that Putin has put together to legitimize its, his own regime, it's clear that he's gone to the antique shop. His ideologists echo one of my favorite 19th century writers, Konstantin Pobjedonostsev who wrote a wonderful manifesto on unshakable autocracy, which was an influential apologia for Tsarist rule written in the wake of Tsar Alexander II's assassination in 1881. And Putin has taken large clumps of this throne and altar stuff right out of the dusty old cupboard of Tsarist self-justifications. Dreary Dostoevskian tropes about the superiority of Russian spiritual and communal values are once again popular with regime apologists. They really reached into the cupboard of old reactionary stuff that used to be part of my heritage, and so I know it well. The regime's, and the modern version is worth noting, the regime's official hostility towards gay rights is not an incidental or unimportant signal. It's central to its self-image as a defender of traditional, traditional values against decadent, soulless, secular individualism. Now, the authoritarian apologetics of Russia and China may not be appealing, but it doesn't make them ideologically aggressive. That's another point I, I, I want to emphasize. They make a national claim to legitimacy, not a universal one. <coughs> Chinese rulers may believe when you have dinner with them in China's civilizational superiority, but they've not embarked on a civilizing mission for the whole world. Mao may once have encouraged Maoists from Peru to Paris, but the current regime has no such ambitions. It may want global power, but it does not seek global ideological hegemony. And the same is true of Russia. Unlike Stalin, Putin is never going to claim that his country is the universal home of all those seeking emancipation from the capitalist yoke. So in the absence of a universalizing ideology, the new authoritarian states may be aggressive and nationalist in rhetoric, but they're unlikely to be expansionist. Chinese rulers know they still have several hundred million poor peasants to integrate into a modern economy. It will be decades before their per capita income comes close to Western levels. And as for Putin, he knows he can't afford fantasies of global power. His basic concern is to defend entirely traditional Russian state concerns, and this defines the content and extent of his nationalism. His annexation of Crimea is, in essence, the return of Russia to a frontier on the Black Sea, first established by Catherine the Great. So far, so reassuring. But <coughs> even if Putin's basic goals are Russian state interests of a traditional 19th century kind, it's still an open question whether, where exactly he defines the boundaries of the Russian sphere of influence. The Baltic states, the Eastern European states once inside the Soviet bloc, Georgia and Armenia, are all asking this question. The territorial integrity of every one of these post-communist states now appears to be in question. Because where does the Soviet sphere of influence lie? And to what extent does that sphere of influence wish to constrain their sovereignty and freedom of action? That, it seems to me, is a crucial and unresolved question. A for Putin, we need to remember, is a former KGB agent whose darkest moment was burning Soviet code books in the garden of the KGB station in Dresden in November 1989. Such a person is bound to be nostalgic 
for the fear that the Soviet system was able to radiate from Moscow outwards to its satellite states. So as a KGB agent, I would warrant that Putin is a voluptuary of fear. But a voluptuary of fear, a real master of the arts of fear, needs to know how far to go. And I think Putin is a realist in this sense. He seems to understand both the limits and the extent of his capacity to intimidate and control the near abroad. Let me tell you a story I heard in Sarajevo two weeks ago, which I think illustrates this point perfectly. I hear from reliable sources that in 2005, when he met the Macedonian president, and the Macedonian president told Putin that he was going to take Macedonia into NATO and uh, into uh, the EU, he expected an explosion. In fact, Putin waved it away. Little country, don't care. And said, I don't care about you because you're not Georgia and you're not the Ukraine. And other Balkan leaders heard of that conversation three minutes after it concluded <laughs> and drew the conclusion that Russia would not intervene to prevent both <coughs> other Balkan states from joining the EU and NATO. So if the Balkans are safe, if Putin is not for the moment defining his sphere of influence as kind of the Drina, you know, um, I think the same thing can be true said of the Baltic states. For all this talk about protecting Russian speakers in the near abroad, it seems unlikely, at least to me, that he will intervene in any of the Baltic states, provided that NATO's Article 5 security guarantee remains credible. He will be content to keep the Baltic peoples on the qui vive, to force them to respect Russian minority rights and to spend more on defense than they would like to. Nor will he touch Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania, or Bulgaria. He accepts that they have left his orbit, though, and this is a significant proviso, his secret services will do whatever they can to destabilize their politics. Now, Georgia and Ukraine, on the other hand, are an entirely different matter from the Russian point of view. Allowing NATO base rights in the Black Sea could have impinged upon Russia's access through the Turkish Straits to the Mediterranean, and thus limit Russia's capacity to resupply their Syrian ally and to counteract American influence in the Middle East. All of these strategic concerns would be entirely recognizable to Count Gorchakov, foreign minister of Russia in the 19th century. It's absolutely traditional 19th century sphere of influence stuff. Equally traditional and Russian has been Putin's establishment of privileged energy and political relations with the Muslim republics on his southern frontier. Because these tributary states have been tributary states of Russia since the mid-19th century. Now, what, how do we, given that I've delimited the Russian sphere of influence as best I understand it from their actions, where do we put Ukraine? Ukraine, as everyone knows, was once part of the Russian Empire. But thus far, and I say this with some hesitation, thus far, Putin's refusal to aid Russian separatists directly suggests that his strategy is not to return Ukraine to the Russian fold, but simply to make life as difficult as possible for the new Ukrainian regime and constrain its sovereignty and freedom of action at every possible. But that's to say he wants to destabilize and control Ukraine without having to own its problems. The relative equanimity with which he has greeted the recent EU-Ukraine pact, charting a, a pro-European path for Ukraine, his equanimity towards that means that he may be only too happy to have you poor Europeans lumbered with the exorbitant costs of writing the Ukrainian economy. NATO membership, however, would cross a red line. So far and no further seems to be the essence of the Putin message, and this is a defensive rather than expansionist message. But this is not the end of the matter. I think I've summarized the conventional wisdom on this issue, and now I'm going to add something that I think is test the common sense a little bit. How the Ukrainian crisis develops in the future depends on how Europe and Russia understand their economic interdependence in a global age. Who needs the other more? Will German dependence on Russian gas cause Merkel to res resist sectoral sanctions if Putin does decide to support the secessionists? 
Or will Putin conclude that he needs German energy markets more than he needs the dissenters in Donetsk? This is still an open question. The idea that this is over seems to me to be one of the messages I want to pass. It's not over. It's barely begun. And these questions are unsettling because we've answered these kind of questions before in 1914 and got them wrong. In 1914, in influential thinkers, I'm thinking, for example, of Norman Engel, wrongly assumed that globalization was so advanced at that time that nations' common economic interests would prevail over nationalist fervor, righteous indignation, and embittered memory. And today, in the globalization era of Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Gazprom, we're even more vulnerable to that false narrative of globalization, the false narrative that economic integration trumps uh, nationalism. And one of the reasons that this needs to be said with particular force in relation to Ukraine is that simmering just beneath the Ukraine crisis are emotions of absolutely volcanic force. Two competing genocide narratives, one Russian, the other Ukrainian, that cannot and will not acknowledge each other's truth. In the Russian narrative of Ukrainian nationalists as fascists, there lurks the poisonous historical memory that many Ukrainians did welcome the Nazi invasion in 1941, and many did go on to collaborate with the Germans in the extermination of Ukrainian Jewry. In the competing Ukrainian narrative, Putin's design is to reimpose Soviet domination, the very domination that resulted in the forced starvation of 7 million Ukrainian peasants between 1931 and 1938. In this land that Timothy Snyder of Yale has so compellingly called the Bloodlands, the memory of the Holodomor confronts the memory of the Holocaust. And these combustible materials need to be borne in mind whenever we're tempted to think that the Ukrainian crisis has been successfully de-escalated. It would only take a spark, an assassination, an unprovoked attack by one group against another to set Ukraine ablaze and for the Russians to intervene this time in full force. And then the danger of intervention is not that Putin takes Ukraine bad as that might be, but that he loses control of events once the cauldron of historical memory overflows and, we, and a great part of Europe, for whom I have passionate feeling, tumbles into the horror of civil war. Wise policy then, and now I begin to talk hopefully some thoughts about what we ought to do here. Wise policy obviously has to keep the cauldron of memory below boiling point. Both Russia and West have a converging interest in de-escalating the rhetoric of insult and injury. In the long term, Europe should give Ukraine a route towards European integration. International financial institutions should use loan conditionality to force a corrupt and entrenched Ukrainian political elite to clean house once and for all open up their economy, devolve power to the regions, and, just as important, guarantee Russian speakers a full place in the Ukrainian political future. At the same time, and here we can have a debate, I may be wrong about this, the question of NATO membership should be deferred as a concession to Russian concerns, but held in reserve to soothe Ukrainian fears. So in effect, the policy line we're walking is a very fine one. We're balancing two competing ad ad objectives, defending Ukrainian independence and territorial integrity while acknowledging that the Russians have a legitimate sphere of influence on the Black Sea. Wise policy in Ukraine must also secure, and this, well, now we get into domestic European politics, wise policy in Ukraine must also secure domestic support among European electorates at home. And here the crisis lays bare a deeper problem. At exactly the moment when more Europe seems to offer a solution to the Ukrainian crisis, electorates across Europe are saying, we want less Europe. Voters in the prosperous North are tired of bailing out the economies of the South and alarmed northward migration of Romanians, Bulgarians, and other Eastern Europeans. Further enlargement, which could stabilize Ukraine and the Balkan states, has become very, very unpopular. So the Ukrainian crisis arrives at that ghastly moment when the solution has lost legitimacy with the electorate who needs to support it. But once again, the memory of 1914 should focus our minds on what's at stake here. 
faraway places of which Western Europeans know little can have a way of dislodging the state order of a whole continent, the European project since 1945 was there to provide an alternative to the structures of imperial rule that failed so drastically in 1914. The deepest premise of the European project is that the continent is one. From Ireland on the west to the Polish border on the east, from Stettin in the Baltic, as Churchill said, to Constanza on the Black Sea, Europeans have lost sight of an ideal as simple as it was appealing. One market, one people, many languages, and many different kinds of democracy, but all committed to end war in the European home. Much has gone wrong with the European project. I hardly need to tell this audience. And I don't want to deny the force of the disillusion in Europe or deny the necessity of reform of European institutions. I just beg Europeans, especially British ones, to remember what Europe is for. If Europe fails to integrate the Balkan states and Ukraine quickly, if these states languish in a halfway house for a decade or more, as most now assume, we risk creating a security vacuum on the southeastern frontier with negative consequences for the security of Europe as a whole. These implications of the European debate are entirely missing from the British discussion about Brexit, whether to stay in or get out, and they're entirely absent from the mean and crab <coughs> European debate about, about immigration control. Everybody in this audience needs to raise their sights to what matters. Allowing Europe to split in two, allowing a second continent on the southeast frontier to languish at the doors of the European house is a recipe for trouble. Let me conclude with some words about the, European, the American stake in this crisis. Because their stake is somewhat different and somewhat larger. And I put emphasis that Ukraine needs to be owned by Europe. This is primarily up to Europe to, Europe to solve. But the Americans have a stake as well. What matters to the United States is the confrontation with two authoritarian capitalist regimes that offer a systemic challenge as systemic challenge to the liberal capitalist order that America put in place after 1945. Sir Adam Roberts in Sarajevo reminded us, and reminded me certainly, that one of the things about the liberal order put into place after 1945 was that it was pluralist. That is, it accepted there are different regime types that suit different peoples. And we live in a world of plural disagreements about how to organize political society. And you can't have any international order that is going to be stable unless the pluralism, the depth of people's disagreement about how society should be ordered, is acknowledged and reflected in international ar ar arrangements. And the message there is very clear. You can't face the resurgent authoritarianism of Russia and China with the moral claim that liberal democracy is the only acceptable way to order political relations. A liberal order has to accept fundamental differences of moral views and political organization because only a pluralist order can guarantee peace. And it's worth remembering, since the word containment has returned to policy discussion, and the Chinese and Russians hate the word containment, that containment did not seek to roll back the authoritarianism of the day, challenge its zones of influence, or claim that liberal democracy had a warrant to rule the world. We forget that simple fact about the Kennan doctrine. It did not preach liberal democracy as a virtue that should be imposed on others, still less at the point of a sword. Containment was a doctrine to avoid war in a pluralist world. And so we need to remember that as we go back and think about what usable items we can dust off from the cupboard of the past, accepting, as I've said throughout, this is not the new Cold War. I would argue, I think, simply that the new authoritarians cannot be changed, but they can be contained, and they can be weighted out. The United States should do what it can to keep the two authoritarians apart, to build relations with each other, with each that offer them alternatives to greater integration with each other. And it's obvious, too, that the United States will have to provide credible deterrence by land, sea, and air to any authoritarian threat to the territorial integrity of allied states from the Baltic to the China Sea. But my point here is that strategic balancing and this the revivification of American uh, security guarantees is important, but it will not be enough. Because the, there is a battle of ideas here. 
and it will be won not on the high seas of East Asia, the desert borderlands of Iraq and Syria, or the bloodlands of Ukraine. The real battle lies at home. If authoritarian capitalism is the emerging challenge to liberal order in the 21st century, the needed response is to reform liberal democracy at home. What alarms America's allies is not weakening credibility of its strategic guarantees. American power remains overwhelmingly credible when used with discrimination and care. The real problem is democratic dysfunction at home. The 20-year impasse between Congress and the executive branch, the reality fleeing polarization and political argument, the gross failure to control the invidious power of money, the weakening domestic infrastructure, and above all, public disillusion with democracy itself. You can't stand up to authoritarians abroad unless you believe deeply and passionately in the viability of liberal democracy at home. And American democracy is in need of reform. Modest, incremental, cautious reform, but reform nonetheless. Other liberal democracies, and I speak here as a Canadian, face similar challenges. But they have got money under control in their politics, and they have rebalanced their political systems so that executive and legislative branches function effectively. All the world is not America, and other democratic systems offer developing societies a variety of compelling ways to get where Lant Pritchett, my colleague, says, getting to Denmark. And we all want to get to Denmark, <laughs> or most of us. But America remains the democracy whose state of health determines the credibility of the liberal capitalist model to the world at large. And there are many reasons why the advance of liberal democracy since 1989 has been checked. There are actually fewer democracies in the world today than there were in 2000. And one of the reasons, I think, is the waning attractiveness of the American model, not just to overseas, but to its own people. America's capacity for leadership has always depended on more than the particular character of presidents. And the infantile discussion about whether Obama is weak or strong is a sign that no one is addressing what seems to me to be the fundamental issue. The fundamental source of American power in the post-war world was inner confidence in the robust combat of democratic debate at home, together with broadly shared faith in the egalitarian ideal at the heart of the American dream. These elements of faith were never stronger than in the great generation that returned home from the Second War. That leadership that they brought to the world was built on American might, to be sure, and it was not error-free, but it did repose on a broadly-based public faith in American institutions and American equality. And these elements have been sapped by 50 years of ill-conceived adventures abroad from Vietnam to Iraq and increasing democratic dysfunction at home. The past 50 years have not been happy ones for the United States, and this has triggered a succession of narratives about American secular decline. And this allows me to say, and I really am coming to the end, that this is another false narrative. For some, the rhetoric of American decline is a source of schadenfreude, for others, a source of alarm. But either way, this narrative seems false. It neglects the historical analysis, it, it neglects the historical evidence of the American capacity for institutional renewal, the Progressive Era, the New Deal, the New Frontier, and the Reagan Revolution. And it also neglects the hard facts of American companies commanding position in the leading technologies that will shape the 21st century. So predicting American decline here seems to me a false narrative that's either foolish or at the very least premature. But it does not mean that America does not face formidable <coughs> challenges of renewal. Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, is surely right when he says that a revived foreign policy capable of meeting the challenge of the new authoritarianism must begin at home with determined incremental institutional reform of American democracy. And President Obama is surely right when he says that nation building abroad can wait. It's nation building at home that must take priority. The challenge of the new authoritarianism essentially is to put America's own house in order, to revive among its own people the faith that liberal democracy can reform itself and rise to the challenges of the hour. After Crimea, after the bloody caliphate rising on the banks of the Tigris, after the rising tension in the China Sea, we do not need foolish adventures abroad or false partisanship at home still less words that are not backed up with deeds. 
We need a Europe and a United States whose people believe once again in their own institutions and relish the chance to prove in peaceful competition that they can meet the challenge of the new authoritarianism.